Okay, so if you are here for a talk on the ancient origins of five everyday words and why they matter, then you are absolutely in the right place. So thank you so much for coming along today and joining me. Uh, so yeah, um, before we kick off, let me just very quickly introduce myself. Um, so as you probably already know, my name is Emily and like you guys, I love learning languages. So I actually work as the uh, languages manager at a company called Utalk. Um, so we have an app for learning more than 150 languages uh, and we're adding more languages all the time. Um, and that means that through my work every day, I've had exposure to a great many languages over the years, um, including some ancient ones. So uh, what I want to show you guys today, actually, though, is that um, you don't have to work with languages every day. You don't have to be a linguistics expert. Um, you don't even need to actually have an extra special passion for languages uh, to be impacted by multiple languages on a daily basis. Um, and so in, in talking to you guys about that, I hope to prove to you that all languages matter. Um, including ancient ones that maybe aren't spoken every day anymore. So first of all, I would like to ask you guys if anyone here knows any ancient languages or some words from any ancient languages. Um, if you do, please share in the chat. So I'll give you a clue, I'll give you the first one. Um, ancient Greek, that is an ancient language. Yes, Yulia says that she had Latin in school. Cool. Um, Angela says that sugar is um, a word that originally came from an ancient language. Yes, do you know which ancient language that word comes from originally? I don't think I actually knew that one. <laughs> Arabic, it could well be. Yes, I know that um, words like candy, they originally came from, from classical Arabic. <laughs> yeah okay someone else is saying um that chocolate is uh, originally from an ancient language called Nahuatl um yes it is good job uh and who knows where Nahuatl is spoken yeah spoken in Mexico amazing and it's still spoken even today by about a million people I think very good. Cool. Okay. Um, let's have a look and see some more. So I've just done a quick brainstorm here of a few uh, ancient languages, some of which are not really spoken anymore, but some very much are, but in a slightly different form. Um, one that I think personally is particularly interesting is uh, Sanskrit. So did you know that Sanskrit is actually still spoken today by some people as a regular everyday language? Um, so there's a village in northern India, a village called Matur. Um, and I actually uh, was lucky enough to, yeah, in India, that's right, northern India, I was lucky enough to connect with some Sanskrit speakers here in London. Um, and so uh, I, I worked with them, which was really fascinating, learned a lot about uh, how Sanskrit has influenced um, many European languages and we will unpack that a bit later on during this talk. Very good. So um, some other languages that we've got up here are Aramaic, Hebrew, Chinese, uh, Farsi, Tamil, Korean. So we're going to be looking at a few of these languages today. Unfortunately, we don't have time to look at all of them. So uh, yeah, languages are constantly evolving. Um, some at a faster rate than others for various reasons, but I think we can agree that mostly the fundamental base remains intact, um, as does a significant amount of vocabulary. So uh, yeah, some of you have already shared in the chat um, some words that you know, which originally come from a different language. Uh, now's your opportunity to pop in some more, if any more have come to you as we've been mulling this over. Don't worry if you can't think of any right now, because over the next 45 minutes, you are going to learn quite a few. <laughs> I'm just curious to know if anyone knows any already before we kick off. 
Um, or maybe there's a word that you know that comes from a different language, but it might not necessarily be kind of an ancient word or an ancient language. So if you do know any, please do pop them in the chat. Sometimes they're quite easy to spot because they don't quite resemble the normal pattern in your native language. Um, or maybe it could be a, a product which you know, which has been imported from another country because it's not native to, to where you live. Um, that can also be a bit of a clue. And um, sometimes other words, they, they had foreign roots, they, they do have foreign roots at their base. Uh, but over the years they've evolved and, and molded as they've become fully absorbed into the new cultures. So then it can be a bit trickier to trace the origins of these words. Um, so you guys are on fire. You are putting absolutely loads in the chat. I'll just read a few. So someone, um, Yulia says philosophy from Greek. Yeah, university and school, they come from Latin. Very interesting. Coffee, yes. Kudos, oh, nice one. Tea, domod. I don't know what that is. I feel stupid for not knowing what that is. Um, so I'm learning stuff here as well, cool. We've also got chai, um, some words in German and some Irish influences, yes, for sure. Someone else put democracy. I think that's another one from ancient Greek, very good. Okay, so you guys already know quite a few, very good. Um, cool, so uh, yeah. We've definitely got a few food items in there. I think they're quite classic examples, aren't they? Um, so I don't know about you guys, but whenever I go traveling, uh, I get light bulb moments when I'm suddenly confronted with a familiar term, for example, or very often um, when I try different foods at different restaurants. Uh, so for example, I recently traveled, I was lucky enough to travel to Mexico um, and someone already mentioned in the chat that there's uh, this connection with Mexico and chocolate. So I found a lot of uh, chocolate related or cocoa products. Um, so uh, tea and um, some kind of sauce with chocolate or cocoa base. Um, and I got chatting to some of the market store owners there. And I quickly found out that the cocoa bean is uh, or was originally native to Mexico. Um, and that explains why there are a lot of cocoa products there. Um, so if you guys ever go to Mexico, I uh, really recommend that you try the mole poblano. This is a sauce, um, a cocoa-based sauce um, that happens to actually be the national dish of the country. Um, and it also contains some chili in it. And this is another plant that is native to Mexico. Um, so unsurprisingly, both the words chili and chocolate, they originally come from Nahuatl, this indigenous language of Mexico, which was uh, the language of the Aztecs. Um, and so these two uh, delicious foods and the words used to name them, they've been absorbed into many languages the world over. Cool. So those words were um, just for free. <laughs> so let's bring our focus back and um, actually back onto you guys for a minute. I want you guys to think about your favorite class at school or uni. What was the subject? Was it maths? Did you really love biology, music, maybe politics or history? So did you know that all of these subject names actually come from ancient Greek? Let's have a look at the ancient Greek examples. So in maths, we have, I'm really sorry, I don't speak Greek. I'm going to try my best to pronounce it okay, but it might not come out quite right. <laughs> so you have Nathema for maths, uh, Philosophia for philosophy, Biosologia for biology. So Bios means life and Logia, that refers to study. So that's how biology got its name. Musique for music. Uh, polites for politics. So I understand that polis means citizen in, in Greek, in ancient Greek, and um, polis me meant city. So that's how politics got its name. So I think you guys probably will be well aware already that Greece was the birthplace and basis of many modern discoveries. 
Um, although interestingly, supposedly ancient Indian scholars discovered uh, the key mathematical formula commonly known as Pythagoras long before this ancient Greek scholar. Um, and as we know, many ancient civilizations were, were really quite advanced um, at various points. But um, it is true that ancient Greece and their education system made a really profound and lasting impact um, even on, on how we do things today and what, what we know today. Great. So I realized that thinking back to school and studying, um, maybe that doesn't bring back the happiest memories for everybody. <laughs> so let's focus in on one everyday word, um, which I think, I hope is something that everybody can relate to. Um, and that is the word music. So let's have a look and see just how far reaching this uh, ancient Greek word has really gone out and spread the world over into so many different languages. Um, I will not read out all of these examples because you can see them on your screen in front of you, um, but you will see that the influence from ancient Greek for this word musike is really far reaching. And um, we've got musiki in Azeri, musica in Latvian, uh, musica in Arabic, musica in Malagasy, Oh, so many, the list goes on and on. Uh, musica in Serbian, music in German, great, yeah. So, so far reaching all over the world. So I appreciate that for some of the languages that you can see up there, the word for music has uh, muscled its way into the language due to the neighboring dominating language. Uh, for example, the current commonly used Basque word for music uh, so that is musica. This was likely, very likely to have been calced from, from Spanish, their neighboring uh, dominant language of the area. Um, and another example is the word in Tagalog, it's also musica. Uh, and this is likely due to the historical influence of English um, and also Spanish. But even still the initial word musica came from Greek. And then it, as you can see, uh, it filtered into a great many languages the world over. So sometimes it came directly from the Greek, but more often it came indirectly through the influence of other languages, which if you go back far enough, had had direct contact with the language of ancient Greek and ancient Greece in the past. So that is our first word out of five. So let's move on to our second word now. So I now want you guys to think about your favorite food. What is your favorite food? What are some key ingredients used to make your favorite food? And does it include any ingredients which are not originally native to your country? Um, although they might actually be commonly grown there now. So some examples could be uh, potatoes or tomatoes. Yeah. Or maybe your favorite dish actually includes some ingredients which can't be grown in the country where you live. Um, the climate just isn't right. Uh, and so because of that it has to be imported from another country. Maybe it also includes some finishing touches, some herbs and spices that have to come from another country. All right, so here we have a map of the world and some different trade routes from times gone by. Oh, go back for a second, sorry. There we go, there it is. So thanks to the age of exploration and trade, concepts, ideas, and materials started to move all around the globe. Ginger came to Europe from China, potatoes, chilies, tomatoes and some other crops, they came from the Americas. Uh, black pepper and cinnamon, they originally came from India via the Middle East. And these are just a few of the valuable commodities that we know and love today in the 21st century. Um, and in some cases, we can see that the name traveled with the food item itself. I'll just give you a quick example. So many translations of the word cinnamon have the same root, um, can or sin, such as kanili in Finnish, kinamon in Hebrew, kerfa in Arabic, and karafa in Oromo. 
And then we have cinnamon in Japanese, cinnamoni in Tongan, cimet in Macedonian, and cinnamon in Mongolian. So you can definitely see some links there. So not only food, but we can uh, also trace some etymology through uh, drinks, popular drinks as well. So yes, let's focus on our second word. You guys already had a sneak preview of that, and it is coffee. Who here enjoys coffee? I would hazard a guess that about half of you guys tuning in today drink coffee on a daily basis. <laughs> Did you know that after crude oil, the coffee bean is actually the most traded commodity in the world today? It's very impressive. So coffee, well, whilst coffee itself is not exactly ancient, coffee beans are, and so is the original Arabic language, which is where this popular energy boosting drink got its name. So let's first go back to the start. Uh, some story, story time for you. So the coffee bean is thought to have been first discovered by 9th century goat herder Chaldi in the Kaffir region of Ethiopia. The story goes that uh, one day, moving on to new pastures, his goat started acting in a very strange way. And Chaldi noticed that they were munching on an as of yet unidentified plant with red berries, which happened to be highly caffeinated. Now I have to let you know that this story is not 100% verified. Um, it is ancient after all, so we can't be 100% certain, but it is thought that this bean got its original name from the region it was first discovered in, Kaffa. So you see where I'm going with this now. Um, and then coffee was frequently traded by Arabs across the Red Sea, not long after its discovery. So from there, it made its way to Turkey, then to Europe and beyond. Now, funnily enough, coffee in Amharic, which is the language of Ethiopia, is actually Buna, um, which happens to be the capital of the Kaffa region. Um, so that's interesting. <laughs> But we can trace the calf sound across uh, a great many languages the world over. So you can see a number of examples up on your screen there. I'm just going to grab a bit more water before we carry on, sorry. Oh, it's that time of year, I have a bit of a tickly throat, sorry about that. Um, so some of you have shared uh, how you say coffee in some of the languages that you know, that's great. So we have cafe in Spanish, cafe in Romanian, cafe in German, cafe in French. Yeah, so um, absolutely, you can see the influence of this route across so many languages, um, not just European ones, but far beyond that. And um, we have Hebrew, Japanese, Azeri, Korean, Macedonian, the list goes on. Great, so that was our second word. Now let's move on to our next word. So moving on from something that you put in your body every day now to something that you put on your body every day, which is crudes, of course. <laughs> So one thing that I love about travel is people watching and seeing different types of traditional dress, as well as different clothing styles worn in the day to day. Who can resist being mesmerized by the flowery embroidered shirts and dresses of Mexico, or the sparkly, brightly colored saris and kurtas of India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Nepal? Now, did you know that the word sari originally comes from a Sanskrit word? meaning a strip of cloth. Sanskrit has had a huge influence on a great many Indo-European languages, not least Hindi. And words like sari have been directly borrowed from Hindi the world over, because that is clearly a style that is really quite unique to this part of the world. Um, and so if you're not Indian, if you don't live in India, or you're not celebrating an Indian festival with Indian friends, for example, you're probably unlikely to find yourself wearing one. <laughs> Um, so most languages, I think, have not made up their own word for this type of clothing because it's not a commonly used word um, outside of this area where it's worn um, quite frequently. 
So the simple choice is to just directly borrow it from, from Hindi. Um, but some clothing styles have found their way into the mainstream across many countries, especially Western ones. So let's look at some examples. Well, a great example that I have here is the poncho. <laughs> so this is originally from the Americas. Interestingly, no one is sure exactly which part of the Americas the poncho came from. Um, some people think it's Mexico, some people think it's Ecuador, other people think it's Peru. No one is 100% sure. Um, but they are now worn almost everywhere. Uh, let me know if you have one in the chat. Um, I have one, I wear it nearly every day at work in the winter because they are so warm. Um, so please, if you don't have one, do yourself, do yourself a favor this winter and get one. You will not regret it. <laughs> it will make your winter a lot more cozy. That is if you live in a cold place like me. Um, I'm sure if you live in a warmer place, you probably would not require one. <laughs> cool, and some other really popular clothes. Um, well, shoes actually are occasions. So, or yeah, more occasions. Um, so they were originally made from animal hide by indigenous groups living in Canada um, and pashmina shawls as well. They originally came from people dwelling in the mountains of Nepal, Tibet and India and other parts of Central Asia. They used to make uh, them from goat hide to cope with the harsh weather conditions there. Um, let's just think back. Uh, oh, we've already talked a bit about some occasions actually. So um, yeah, definitely a great way to cope with the cold weather, especially um, in years gone by when um, central heating did not exist. <laughs> great, so let's uh, hone in on this word poncho. We've got some pictures of some lovely ponchos up on your screen there. Um, so how did this handy garment get its name? Well, as I already mentioned, we're not exactly sure where in the Americas the poncho first uh, came from. Um, and we actually also can't be completely sure which language the poncho um, actually, yeah, was first named poncho. Um, so we can be sure that uh, it is from um, a language of uh, South or Central America. And many people are confident that it surfaced in either Quechua or Mapuche. Um, so a little bit of history for you, for those of you who don't know, the Spanish, um, they did not arrive in, uh, in the Americas until the 15th century, um, but I'm sure that you'll be well aware that uh, many people have been living there for thousands of years prior to the arrival of the Spanish. Um, actually, most anthropologists believe that the indigenous people of Latin America descended from people who first migrated to North America from Asia, um, and they believe that happened about 15,000 years ago. So ancient indeed. <laughs> so we can be sure that the arrival of the Spanish uh, 700 years ago had a huge impact on the world. And you can make up your own mind about the positive and negative sides of that. Um, but it, it was the Spanish traders in this case who were responsible for bringing this garment, this now well-loved garment to Europe and beyond. Okay, so our next word is uh, about, well, it's a, it's a colour. So ponchos are, are known for their bright colours um, and these obviously originally came from dyes. Now dyes are mostly synthetic nowadays, um, but does anyone know how people used to make dyes in ancient times? Plants, yeah. That's right, plants and anything else? Bugs, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Absolutely. And natural minerals as well um, and other kinds of animals too, I think. Um, and of course, colors are complex. There are many shades of colors. Someone's put blood. Oh, I'm not sure about that. You're probably right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, someone is saying, what are dyes? They don't understand the word, that's fine. A dye um, is uh, something that gives, uh, oh, someone put the German word there. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. 
so it's a pigment so it um is uh something that you can then put on material that makes it a nice color awesome so uh there are many different shades of colors anyone who works in art fashion or interior design will be acutely aware of this um, not just your simple red yellow blue green whatever um, and I think that the naming of colours in different languages is a really fascinating thing to look into. Um, so just as a side note, did you know that in Russian, there are individual words for light blue or sky blue, which is galuboy, and dark blue, which is sini. Um, I think that's really interesting. Uh, I think that's quite unique. Um, yeah, so, so the fourth ancient word that we are going to investigate actually comes from the ancient language of the Middle East or Central Asia, um, known as Proto-Indo-Iranian, and it has links with Sanskrit and Classical Arabic. Um, I would ask you guys to guess what the colour is, but I won't be that mean because it's probably not immediately obvious. Um, so the word that we're going to look at is crimson. Here we go. So uh, a bit of history again for you. This brightest of red colours um, comes from, or used to come from, squishing small female insects, which are about the size of a pea. They live on Kermes oak trees, originally found in the Middle East. Um, it's therefore thought that the name derives from the name of the insect itself, which is also called Kermes, um, from this proto-Indo-European word, Kermes. So we can clearly see that this word was absorbed into Sanskrit, uh, Kruma, um, and from there into many other languages of India. Um, we also have Kermist in Persian and in Arabic, Kermist. Interestingly, this became Koch in Latin, uh, which then influenced many languages spoken in Europe, such as Koch in Welsh and Kokinos in Greek. Um, we can also trace the same root into Russian. Um, Oof, hard for me to pronounce. I will let you guys look that one up for yourself. <laughs> um, and here you can see a ton of other examples as well. So the influence is as far reaching as uh, Sesotho, spoken in Southern Africa, um, to uh, all the way over Europe, Turkish as well. Great, so now you know how crimson got its name. Okay, so let's move on to our final word, our fifth and final word. So we've been talking about various products which found their way from one part of the world to another through trade, but we haven't yet discussed travel or specifically modes of transport. So if you go back far enough, we can make an educated assumption that the, uh, the Americas began to be settled um, when the Paleolithic hunter-gatherers entered North America from North Asia. Um, there was a land bridge known as the Beringia Land Bridge. Um, and this formed between Northeastern Siberia and Western Alaska due to the lowering of the sea levels during the last glacial maximum, which was about 26 to 19,000 years ago. So that's some ancient history for you. Uh, but more recently, uh, travel happened by various types of boat, um, and an example is a uh, canoe. Canoe dug out of a tree trunk, most likely, originally. Um, so another story, well, the story goes that uh, Columbus, he first came into contact with canoes in the New World, where the Taino people, so these people, they spoke a language which is now extinct, um, which was spoken in the Caribbean, also called Taino. Uh, and they referred to this handy tool to get around in their language, Taino, as Kanoa. So from there, when Columbus came into contact with it, uh, it was absorbed into the Spanish language. So it was adapted ever so slightly to the word Kanoa. Um, and it's since made its way all around the world, as you can see on this slide. Um, sorry, now you can see it. <laughs> Here we go. So you can see um, that it has entered into many languages all around the world from Uzbek to even Southern Sami, a language um, spoken in, uh, I think, Norway and Finland. Um, Tokpisin, which is a language of Papua New Guinea, 
even in Lao, you can trace the influence. So a really far reaching influence. Amazing. All right, so I don't know about where you guys live necessarily, but um, canoeing is not really a popular method of um, international travel anymore, <laughs> but it's definitely still a very popular hobby, uh, at least in the UK, it's a very popular hobby. Um, and also in many places that I've traveled to, uh, you can hire a canoe to go exploring down a river or a lake or in the sea. Um, so I think we can be sure that this word is here to stay long into the future as well, thanks to the Taino people. All right, so um, so we've honed in on five everyday words today. Um, actually, we've looked at a lot more than just five everyday words. Um, but even then, we've only looked at a very, very small snapshot of commonly used words of ancient origins. We've also unpacked some stories which explain how this came about over ages gone by. And well, maybe you knew some of this history already. Um, but maybe for some of you, this took you by surprise and you will look at these everyday things a little bit differently now. So why does it really matter? Well, I think a lot of you probably will already agree that uh, it does matter. Otherwise, probably you wouldn't have come along to tune into this talk in the first place. Um, but I think that it's important to look back and acknowledge what happened in the past, both the good and the bad. Um, and recognize that we are, and I would argue in one way or another, we have always been interconnected and interdependent um, wherever you are from in the world. Um, and we all have so much to learn and gain from each other. And that's why I would really encourage you to be curious about different cultures and ways of life. Um, and what better way to do that than to dive in the deep end and discover these things through learning languages. I believe that when we practice effective intercultural communication, we live better side by side, understanding, appreciating, and valuing each other better and benefiting from each other too. Um, and I'm sure you guys can think of many ways you have personally benefited from traveling to different countries, working with people from different places and living alongside others who have moved to your country. Um, some different ways that you might have benefited might be from um, enjoying some cuisines from different places, uh, maybe some music from different places, uh, or even clothes as we have looked at, um, and other pastimes that you might enjoy, such as canoeing. Great, so if you enjoyed today's talk, and you feel inspired to learn any of the languages I've mentioned today, uh, you can actually find almost all of them on the app, this app that, uh, that I work for called Utalk. Um, we have a special discount for you guys just at Expolingua, which is 50% off. Um, so you could get a subscription if you would like to for as little as one euro 70 cents per month. Um, and we also share some fun facts and etymology info on our social media accounts. Um, and we participate in other language events and celebrations as well. So you can stay in touch with us on social media. Um, so thank you so much for coming to my talk and um, I wish you a great rest of your Saturday and happy language learning. Um, so one more time, uh, if you would like to check out the app, the special discount that we have, you can find um, on this link here. I will also pop it in the chat for you. We you talk slash bilingual. There you go. Um, and yeah, feel free to put any comments in the chat if you'd like before we um, sign off and say goodbye. Uh, someone is saying, where am I from? Um, I am from a county called Surrey, just south of London. Um, thank you, that's very kind. <laughs> Happy to hear that um, you did not mind listening to my accent during this talk. Um, oh, thank you guys so much for coming. And, um, and that's right, the fifth word that we looked at was puncho. I didn't have a slide for all of the words for that, but puncho you can find in many languages all over the world. 
Um, all right. Well, um, thank you so much, everybody. Have a great weekend and enjoy the rest of Expo Lingua. Thank you.